What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Generation Line podcast. My name is Jesse Rubin. This is the second time we are doing this, but that's totally fine. Um, today, we have an amazing guest, which I will get to in a second. But before I do, I just want to let you know that we have a brand new website, which is genlime.org. We've got a ton of great information on there about our meetups, our podcast, uh, ways that you guys can get involved. We also have brand new merch, which is super fun and designed by our team. Um, also, if you like this podcast and you would like us to do more of them, please rate and review us five stars on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts. It really helps us out a lot to spread the word and get as many people listening as possible. Uh, with all that being said, let's get into it. Today, we have one of the founding fathers, the founding father of Generation Lime, Brooke Stoddard. How's it going, buddy? It's going really well. I'm excited for this. Thanks for having me on. It's my pleasure. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Brooke is also on the board of Generation Lime. He and I uh, met three or four years ago when we were kicking around ideas of ways that we could give back to the Lime community. And we will get into that a little bit later. Um, I do just want to mention right off the top that at the beginning, there was like a, a six to eight month period where Generation Lime was just Brooke and I on the phone every Sunday with nothing to talk about and no direction and nothing to do. But we held down the fort and here we are today. And I'm, I'm pretty proud of that, I think. I'm very proud of what we built too. I think we're helping a lot of people and uh, I'm excited for the next five years of this. Totally. So the way that it's gonna work is we're gonna talk about Brooke's story. We're gonna talk about your story today. And basically the way we do that is sort of break it down very loosely into before your diagnosis, during your treatment, and then quote unquote after whatever that means for you. So. Obviously, not everyone has a clear beginning, middle, and end, so we like to keep it open-ended, but I know that you've had a pretty incredible experience in some good ways and a lot of bad ones, and I know that the information that you're going to share is going to help a lot of people. So let's just kick it off right at the beginning. How old were you when you first realized something wasn't right? There were like alarm bells going off in your head. So I first realized that something wasn't right uh, when I was 26. I, I think I have my first series of notes about symptoms from April, 2010. So at that point in my life, I was living in New York City. I was working in finance. I was 26, almost 27. I had been pretty healthy my entire life. And then I was suddenly very unhealthy and, and sick and symptomatic. And it seemed to sort of happen for me overnight. Um, but essentially I, I woke up one day, I had very rapid heart, heartbeat, kind of like heart palpitations, but just a very rapid heartbeat that felt abnormal and uncomfortable. And I had a lot of brain fog, meaning I couldn't think clearly. I had some short-term memory issues. And I just wasn't like a sharp thinker. And that brain fog lasted the whole day and then the whole week. And during this process, um, through those two major symptoms, I realized that something was really, really wrong, but I didn't know what it was. You said that you took notes. What made you decide to take notes of your, about your symptoms at that time? <laughs> it's a great question because I never, I never overthought it. But I think the reason that I took notes in a Word document on my computer is because the symptoms for me were new. I had never experienced them before. And when I started going to the doctor, I wanted kind of an organized list of all of my symptoms uh, documented as to like when I had experienced them and for how long so that I could provide basically data or evidence to a doctor or a series of doctors, because I thought it would help them diagnose me. So organized. I'm so impressed. <laughs> um, okay. So you're a healthy 26 year old person. You're working in a very stressful, intense environment. Obviously you start experiencing these symptoms. Were you scared? Were you nervous? Were you overly concerned? Did you just assume that everything was going to be fine and this was going to be like a short term thing? Did you also did you did you ever have a tick bite? Did you ever find a bullseye rash? No, 
I, I knew what Lyme disease was growing up. I had some ticks and tick bites when I was a kid. Uh, I even got a Lyme vaccine at one point, the Lyme Rex vaccine when it was on the market wow. uh, when I was a teenager. And I was a, a Boy Scout, so I, I camped and I was very aware of what Lyme disease was. But what was so interesting is when I got sick when I was 26, I had no idea that that was Lyme disease. And so, no, I never saw a tick on my body. I do have some hypotheses as to when or where I would have gotten a tick bite, but I would never be able to prove yeah. when or where I actually got a tick bite. Yeah, I mean, I think that bridging that gap between like this thing that people have heard of called Lyme disease versus the actual reality of Lyme disease, I think bridging that gap is a really important thing that hopefully will happen very soon. And it's just amazing that obviously you're in those environments where it's high risk, you know, if you're hiking in the woods and stuff. And it's amazing that even then you still don't know exactly what it is and how serious it is. And man, I did not know that. I'm learning so much about you today. <laughs> Um, okay, so you have these symptoms. So what what's happening immediately after that? Are you sort of ignoring it? Are you pushing through it? Are you going to doctors? What's 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 happening in your life at that time? Are you still yeah. at work? I, I, I'm still at work. <clears throat> I think you 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 actually said what I felt. I was very <clears throat> I was very scared. Um, I was scared because I have always been focused on achieving things and in my career. And for the first time in my life, it felt like a health problem was going to threaten my career and my, and my future. And so initially I did what anyone would do when you have scary symptoms. I went to doctors and tried to diagnose myself and hoped that I could get back to normal quickly. I found out that that you know, wouldn't be possible, but, but the biggest like emotion that I dealt with was, was fear because I felt that I didn't, I didn't know what my health problem was, but I was worried it was going to derail my career. And I didn't, I didn't really know how to handle that because I had just always been very career or previously very school focused. Um, and so having something kind of, uh, get in the way of that was, was a very scary feeling for me. Nothing like having a major chronic illness to completely derail a life plan and a life outlook. Um, I totally relate to that. So around that time, are you getting di different diagnoses? Are you seeing doctors? How and and also how are your family and friends reacting to, <clears throat> to what's happening to you? If you're if are you even telling them what's happening to you? Yeah, it's interesting. I think I started telling my family right away <clears throat> that something was wrong. And they were very supportive. My mom was incredibly supportive. We started talking on a daily basis and she would just sort of comfort me and listen to whatever I wanted to say about that day's set of symptoms. Um, and so I relied on her for a lot of support at that period of my life. Um, I was also telling my friends that something was wrong. And then I was selectively telling people at work this, that something was wrong. Um, work was a little trickier because you don't really want to tell your boss or your teammates that you have brain fog um, that creates some uncertainty in a, a corporate environment. But I was making my colleagues aware of other symptoms like fatigue or uh, unusual like food sensitivities, for example, um, that were a little bit easier to you know digest in a corporate setting. So in general, I was pretty open with people in my life as to what was going on. The problem is I just couldn't, I couldn't solve it. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think my my story is in some ways very similar to any Lyme disease patient's story. But at this point in my life, when I was 26, I started going to a collection of doctors and specialists and checking off a lot of conditions that weren't my problem, but no doctor that I saw during that period of time really even mentioned Lyme disease as a potential diagnosis or helped me to understand that that was something that we should, we should test for. So the point is we crossed off things like, um, you know, I don't know, like 
hypertension or like we crossed off heart problems or we crossed off uh, real like digestive, like organ problems due to my food sensitivities, but no doctor or no specialist said, I'm going to look at all of your symptoms together and hypothesize that maybe a tick bite had caused everything that you're dealing with. And, you know, like most Lyme symptoms, I was dealing with probably a dozen symptoms on a, a regular basis. Whereas brain fog and food sensitivities were the ones that I highlight the most because they were the worst for me. They were my strongest, most difficult symptoms at that time. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, how many doctors are we talking about here? When you're saying you're going to all these doctors, is it two or three, is it 35? Like how many doctors and specialists were you seeing at that time? I saw about 10. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's not, it's not 50, uh, like some individuals that we have met, but I certainly saw 10 doctors and, and my path was, I went to my, you know, like general practitioner first, and then the general practitioner sent me to other specialists. So I went to a, a dermatologist because I had a lot of like red kind of rashes and like unusually itchy skin. Um, I went to um, the type of doctor that like does a, uh, like an endoscopy um, to make sure that there wasn't anything wrong inside my digestive system. Um, and so I just started going to like a slew of specialists based on whatever symptoms I was telling my general practitioner about. Isn't that so interesting? Like even just describing your symptoms, it, it sounds like there's some major issue happening in your body, but the way that our healthcare system is set up is you're dealing only with that one specific thing at a time, which just logically you would think would never work or make any sense. I I mean, that's just crazy to me, Uh, but also super common. Um, The other thing I wanted to ask you, because we sort of skipped over this, but you you mentioned you were talking to your mother every single day, right? So first of all, I I think that's really incredible. I just want to point out like, it's not, not everyone has that kind of support right away, you know? And I, so I think for you, I think that's really wonderful that you had that experience, but I'm wondering if you ever, either at the time or since then, ever talked to her about what that period was like for her? It's a great question because years later, I think I've started to understand what that period of time was like for her. And I've started to understand this because of what I've heard from others in our Generation Lime meetups. Totally. Um, and what I mean by that is I've heard from a lot of uh, spouses or parents or um, partners of people who have Lyme disease, and they typically take on a role of listener or supporter or caregiver of the Lyme disease patient. And so years later, when I think back to 2010, which is now 11 years ago, I realized that my mom was playing that type of role. She was supporter, listener, caregiver. She wasn't doctor. She didn't, you know, she didn't tell me, Brooke, you have Lyme disease and you should go test for it and then come up with like a treatment plan. But she listened to me talk about brain fog as a symptom or, you know, mood swings as a symptom or chemical sensitivities as a symptom. And that was very important to me at that time when I was dealing with just a tremendous amount of uncertainty about my health. And as a factor of that uncertainty about uh, my career going forward, because I thought my health would impact that. Totally. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, uh, that's been one of the biggest impacts on me in in being in the Generation Lyme community is really getting the impact of the caregivers and the loved ones, which is something that I, I remember saying to my the people in my life when I was sick, like, listen, I don't have the time or energy to care about what about you at all. Like, I, I can only focus this way. I'm sorry. I, I love you. I think you're great. You know, so I, I think that's really interesting. Um. When were you, were you diagnosed? Were you in India before or after you got diagnosed? Before. Okay. So let's, let's, let's just, let's just talk about this for a second. So you are 
sick. You are like 27, 28 years old. You're still working at Goldman Sachs. You're feeling like garbage. And you spend a year in India? Yeah, I... Um, Did anyone tell you that was a good idea? I remember... I remember wondering if it was a good idea. Um, <laughs> it was uh, like a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just from a logical perspective, like anyone listening to this podcast understands how difficult Lyme disease is to deal with in the United States. And so, you know, migrating that, that experience to another country, whether it's India or somewhere else is very uh, difficult. Like you have to make a decision as to whether or not that makes sense. And so I, 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 did, I did think about it, um, but I also thought that I had this pretty interesting opportunity to move from my role at Goldman Sachs in New York to um, a role in Bangalore, India. And to some extent, I just thought it was worth the risk um, for the you know, experience. And fortunately it was. I had one of the best years of my life in India and dealing with what I didn't know was Lyme disease then was certainly a, like a factor in that experience. But I really, I really loved living in India. It was a blast. So separate from the obvious being on the other side of the world and language barriers and culture shock and all that kind of stuff, what were some of the challenges that you were dealing with over there? I know that chemical sensitivities have been a big part of your Lyme journey. Was that something that you were dealing with in India or was that later? Yeah. Um, by the time I left New York for India, I thought that my condition was a candida albicans infection. So one thing that helped me in India was I had a doctor for that condition in New York City, and that doctor prescribed a drug called Nystatin, which I took on a regular basis when I was in India. And it limited my Lyme disease symptoms a bit, maybe by 20 or 30%. So that enabled me to have like a pretty normal life in India, meaning I, I worked, um, I traveled, I really enjoyed my time there, but Lyme disease affected me because my food sensitivities were a major issue. So in India, I'll put it this way, I didn't eat any Indian food. I ate chicken and um, cauliflower and broccoli and almonds and eggs and that was pretty much it um, during the year and a half that I lived in India, which is ironic because if you go to India, you probably want to try a lot of really interesting cuisine. Of and I frankly was not able to do that because of food sensitivities. In other words, for anyone who doesn't know what food sensitivities are when you have Lyme disease, if you eat carb heavy foods or foods you can't tolerate really well, it just makes all the other Lyme disease symptoms worse. And so I had a very strict diet in order to limit my Lyme disease symptoms enough so that I could do the other things in life that I wanted to do, like work and be a good employee or travel and, you know, have a lot of fun doing that. I mean, that requires a lot of commitment to stick to a plain diet like that when you're in another country. I mean, I think that's pretty incredible. Um, so I took had, a lot of, huh? it, took, it took discipline, but yeah. I did get used to it over time. So I have here uh, that you slept in the bathtub. <laughs> Where and when were you sleep and why were you sleeping in the bathtub? So <clears throat> one of the symptoms that I developed as a result of having Lyme disease was a kind of like hypersensitivity to chemicals. And that impacted me in, in different ways. It changed the types of laundry detergents that I could use or- This is know, while you're in India? Yes. Okay. That's when it started to become a real problem. It probably started a little bit while I was in New York and just got exacerbated um, during my time in India. But chemical sensitivities are like being- uh, you know, a, allergic to something. It, it, it's, it's like if you pump gas and you get a headache, it's that type of reaction. But I became very hypersensitive to chemicals in laundry detergents, liquid soaps, scented products, um, certain like materials that clothes are made of. And so the reason that this was a problem in India was because, um, uh, 
uh, I guess of a, a, a couple of reasons. One, India is a place where um, uh, it's, it's very humid. So there's a lot of mold. I mm -hmm. mean, there were some mold issues that I had to take care of in the place where I lived. Um, but also there were some chemicals uh, like used in environments like uh, chemicals that would sort of set me off and cause me to have allergic reactions that might just be like a chemical used to clean a carpet or a chemical um, used to, uh, you know, like make a room smell good. And so I spent a lot of my time in India dodging a lot of scented products and different chemicals that I was sensitive to. And the way that this played out is I spent most of my time um, in my apartment in like a single room where I could control the air with air purifiers and make sure everything in there was hypoallergenic, but where it was really difficult to control is when I would travel. And so um, this, this particular incident was really kind of like amusing to me, but I traveled from Bangalore to one of the cool, coolest places I've ever gone, um, a, essentially a town called Hampi, H-A-M-P-I, there's some really incredible like ruins there, some UNESCO um, protected ruins. And in the hotel, there was some sort of scented product in the, like the bedroom area um, that I couldn't tolerate. So it was causing me to have brain fog and mood swings and headaches and itchy skin. And it was really uncomfortable even when I kept the windows open. So instead I slept in the bathroom. I, I, I slept in the bathtub because it was, it was the safest place for me in that hotel where I could avoid chemicals that were causing me like a lot of discomfort um, by my body being hypersensitive to them and then inducing types of allergic reactions. That is just wild. Okay, so just really quickly and then we'll, we'll, we'll move on, but you know, you're young, you're, you have this great job, you're, in a foreign country, you're dealing with you're dealing with all this stuff that that most people are not giving a second thought to. You you out of maybe anyone I've met in the Lyme community is are are so upbeat and positive. When you were when you're in India and you're dealing with all this stuff all the time, were you enjoying it? Were you were you was your outlook positive or were you having a hard time? Like, were you bitter? Were you angry? Were you upset? What What was your mental situation like while you were over there? Because because all the stuff you're describing sounds brutal. It just sounds brutal. I I think it was more upset when I was in New York. There was something about being in India that was extraordinary um, and maximized happiness for me at that point in my life. And so in general, uh, I was... I was very happy there, despite having Lyme disease. Um, I wasn't I wasn't angry because I couldn't have Indian food. I was, I think, you know, annoyed because travel was just like more complicated than it would be for people without chemical sensitivity issues. But in general, I remained upbeat because I was having such a great experience there. And I had just over the past probably two years like biohacked my way into limiting my symptoms as much as possible through a strict diet and exercise and sweating and use of a drug nystatin that I could reduce my symptoms by let's just call it 40 percent mm -hmm. and that made Lyme disease which I didn't know was Lyme disease at the time much more tolerable um, and allowed me to do the things that I cared about like work like travel um, like hang out with friends and stuff like that. So in general, it's a great question. Um, the answer is I remained upbeat when I was there because I was having such a great time. You're an angel and I don't know how you do it. Uh, yeah, I was, I was just thinking like my wife is, has, has a ton of allergies. She's allergic to down. And when we travel, that's like a major issue because most hotels have down uh, comforters and pillows because it's the most comfortable. And sometimes you arrive late or in the middle of the night or something and it can be really challenging. And that's just like a normal allergy that most human beings have, right? So to deal with like that level of sensitivity just sounds really stressful. And that's such a great example of what it's like to have chemical sensitivity. It's like most people wouldn't 
have to worry about what is in a pillow when you are traveling. Yeah, just excited but, to be at the hotel. Yeah, yeah. But as people, I think, sort of figure out more about chemical sensitivities and, and allergies, that is a great example because anyone can understand how frustrating it would be to want to go to some place and to be worried about what the pillow is constructed with in the hotel. Okay, so you come back to New York and you're dealing with all these chemical sensitivities. Can you, can you just talk briefly about going back and forth from, to, from Philly to New York? And just like, cause I think that is like one of the crazy, I mean, not crazy, obviously it's necessary, but just like one of the things that like, well, this is what Lyme patients do, you know? Yeah, um, when I when I came back to the United States from India, it was because I got into business school, which was a, a dream of mine. And so I I moved to Philadelphia. I went to Wharton for business school. And one, when I was there, I was still dealing with chemical sensitivities. And the way this manifests in my apartment is I slept on the floor of my apartment, like on the carpeted floor of my apartment for three years because I couldn't find a mattress that I wasn't hypersensitive to two. And if you Google it, you'll, you'll quickly find out that a lot of mattresses have pretty bad chemicals in them. And those bad chemicals, I was very sensitive to. So I, I slept on the floor and um, I, I wore this shirt almost every day to business school. It's my favorite shirt. I still wear it. Um, but that was to protect myself from other types of clothing that I couldn't tolerate. And in having my life revolve around sort of avoiding different chemicals, one rather extreme thing I did that was necessary was when I had finished my first year of business school and went back to New York for a summer internship back at Goldman Sachs, my prior employer, I, I needed to wash my office clothes um, about once a week but I couldn't do it in like a laundromat or even a washer in the apartment complex where I was staying because I was so sensitive to different laundry detergent chemicals that it just didn't work to like throw my clothes and my laundry detergent into a place where there had been other clothes and other laundry detergents. So to combat this, Every Friday, I took a bus, like a, a bolt bus from New York to Philly to go back to my Philly apartment. And I did the laundry there, usually on like Friday night and then Saturday morning. And then I would go back to New York on Saturday night on the bus. That is hilarious. And I am very familiar with that bolt bus. I've taken it many, many times. Love the bolt bus. So how did you finally figure out that you had Lyme because now you're in a it was a couple of years right that you were sick but you didn't know yeah about three and a half years so yeah. how did you finally get an answer to what was going on with you that was causing you to sleep in bathtubs and take a bus to Philly to do your laundry um so I I love my diagnosis story because it's so it's so true to the Lyme disease experience but you know, as I said, I didn't see 50 doctors, but I saw 10 to 15 doctors, mostly in New York, and no one told me that I had Lyme disease. So like it never even came up as an option in a in a in an appointment. To be fair, I do have a note from 2010 where I mentioned it to my general practitioner, and then the note also says general practitioner did not want to test for Lyme disease because there are too many false positives. So we never, we never went down that road. And what here we are talking you? about 11 years of Lyme disease. But it saved you so much time. Oh God. So how, okay. So, so how did you actually finally figure out that this is what was going on? So um, yeah, the reason I love this story is because the first person who really told me that I had Lyme disease was a person named Chad. And Chad was a colleague of mine during my summer internship back at Goldman between my first and second year of business school. And at this point, I'd had Lyme disease for three and a half years. All of my family knew I was sick. My friends knew. I was very open with my coworkers 
certainly by this time they knew about all my symptoms, but I was just kind of like doing my thing. And I was sitting at Goldman Sachs telling this guy, Chad, all about my symptoms. And he said, you know, that's really interesting. Um, you should look into Lyme disease. And the reason is because I've had Lyme disease and my symptoms were a lot, a lot like that. Yeah. I, I, we yeah, love such, Chad. <laughs> we, we love Chad. And I, I mentioned, you've heard me talk about Chad before because that moment in time was so important to me that I'm really grateful for Chad being there and sort of giving me a potential diagnosis for the first time in, in years. Mm. Um, and it was, a, it was a really cool moment. I mean, I have, I have like a piece of paper that I kept where I took some initial notes from our conversation where he basically told me, here's a, an LLMD that you should see in New York. Like here are, you know, antibiotics that you might one day take for this. And so Chad is awesome. I'll always be grateful to him because he was the first person who told me that I might have Lyme disease. And wouldn't you know, he was a Lyme disease patient. And that's why he recognized my condition as a Lyme disease versus so many doctors who had missed it because they've never had Lyme disease or they think Lyme disease is X, but it's really Y. But Chad could see through it all because he'd experienced a lot of the same symptoms that I had. That, that was the original Generation Lyme meetup right there. It I was. Mean, it I, was. I have a similar story. I have a kid I, I went to high school with. I was on tour somewhere. It was like super late at night. I had just played a show. All these people were like partying. And I got a phone call from a number I didn't recognize. And it was a kid named Corey I went to high school with who I never was friends with, didn't know. And he was like, hey, man, so-and-so told me that you were suffering and he was like, I think you have Lyme. I, I, have, I have Lyme disease. I think that's what you have. And that was like the beginning of the next phase of my life. And I, I, should, I should reach out to Corey because I haven't talked to him since. But man. That's awesome. Corey sounds like a terrific guy. We're very pro Corey. So, okay. So you finally have an answer. And I, and I, I want to bring this up because it's something that comes up a lot when, when people are finally know what's going on or when they're really sick and they're in a corporate setting. Um, they, it's hard for people when you're sick, especially to ask for things that you need. And so for you, you had to go to Wharton and Goldman, these two pretty big institutions to talk to them about taking time away. So what was that experience like for you? What made you decide to take time off versus pushing through it like you were doing before? And what was the re response that you got to asking for time off? Yeah, I remember you know, like my conversation with Chad was probably in July of 2013. And I started seeing LLMDs probably that month or in August. And I was like 99% sure that I had Lyme disease by September mm. um, and, and probably 100% sure by October. So things actually moved very quickly, but there was a very strange point in time, which was like the August and September period of time, where I was leaving my summer internship at Goldman and going back to business school for my second of two years. And I knew enough about Lyme disease at that point to realize that recovery might be very slow and that I might benefit from a year off. Hmm. And so what was really difficult and definitely took me about a week to decide to do this was to convince myself that a year off was a good idea because it wasn't, it wasn't so much like losing time per se. It was, I went to business school with like a certain set of friends and students. And like, I just was going to like leave that group and then go hibernate in my apartment for a year. And so there were a lot of things that were complicated about this decision, but I ultimately decided that I had dealt with Lyme disease for too long. I really needed to solve like that problem in my life. And so a year off made sense. The next part was very challenging, which was, and you mentioned it, which was going to Goldman and going to Wharton and asking them for time off. And I have to say, both organizations were incredible. Mm -hmm. I mean, pretty much gave me no pushback. 
um, both said, we really understand and respect this complicated, uh, sometimes like opaque health situation that you're dealing with. And essentially Wharton said, no problem, come back in a year. Um, Goldman said, no problem, you can come work for us a year later. And I, I have to say both organizations were terrific. They treated me very well and they respected this complicated health situation incredibly professionally. That's really amazing that these big institutions, like you think about these big institutions like that and you think of like they're following the rules and they're very money driven, obviously. So it's great to hear that there are organizations that will just will let you take time off to take care of yourself. I think that's really incredible. Um, something else that I that I I definitely want to touch on was after your diagnosis. You know, we we talk about in in on meetups like there's so many different questions about treatments. Everyone wants to know what worked for you, what worked for you, what worked for you. And I know that you are not fully in remission. You've you've mentioned that you're 95 percent better. Um, but you have had a pretty positive experience with antibiotics. And so I just was wondering, like, was that some, did you always want to take antibiotics? Were you, did you do more of the herbal stuff first? Or like, cause I know that a lot of people are very anti-antibiotics or it doesn't work for them. So it's nice to see that some, there's somebody who has had a positive experience with those drugs. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting because you know, when I started seeing my ultimate LLMD, who's, you know, it's, it, it's Kenneth Liegner, um, I didn't, I, I wasn't familiar with treatment plans. I mean, I knew there were antibiotics, I knew there were herbal supplements, I'd already kind of experimented with herbal supplements. And I knew there was this thing called like a, a pick line, right? But I didn't really know which drugs or herbal supplements could tackle Lyme disease and babesiosis, which was my other co-infection. And so as a first step, Dr. Liegner and I tried antibiotics and they were, uh, we tried oral antibiotics and they worked really well for me. I mean, really, really well. They limited my symptoms. They, they limited my symptoms significantly from almost the first, you know, week or so that I was on them Amazing. Um, and made my life materially better. I mean, on a day by day basis. And so what was interesting about this experience is I was taking doxycycline. I was taking um, a Tavaquan proganol for, for babesiosis. And I was taking a third drug called tinidazole, which like breaks up the cyst version of, of Lyme disease. Oh, yeah. Whereas doxy will, will tackle like the spirochetes. And this cocktail of medication for me was just highly effective. Um, I also didn't experience too many or, or really any gut issues. Um, and so I ended up taking this cocktail of antibiotics for five years. Uh -huh. um, you know, some of the drugs were daily, some of them weren't, but I was essentially on oral antibiotics for five years. And so antibiotics alone probably got me 80-ish percent better. Um, I also definitely needed herbal, herbal supplements and I changed the cocktail of things I was on a couple of times over the past eight years. But one thing that was very like educational for me that I learned from Generation Lime meetups is that some people really don't tolerate antibiotics well. And it's so obvious to us now, but because my experience with oral antibiotics was so positive, I was interested in hearing from so many other members of the Generation Lyme community that antibiotics really didn't work for them and don't work for them. And so they seek out other types of treatment protocols. Yeah, I mean, antibiotics for me were basically sugar pills. I mean, it was like, it didn't, I wouldn't get worse. I didn't get better. It just didn't do anything. So, it, I mean, it's amazing. It's, uh, we, you know, we talk about this all the time. Everyone's different. What works for one person has no bearing on if it's going to work for anybody else. Um, speaking of the Generation Lime community, one thing that I did want to mention briefly with you is before we started having these meetups and hosting these meetups, were you connected with other members of the LGBTQ community in the Lime world? Or were you kind of like the only person you knew under that heading? Um, in the Lime world, I can't say that I knew other LGBTQ 
individuals who had Lyme, um, but I was always involved in those communities in other areas of my life, like in the financial services sector or in business school. Um, so, you know, for me, um, in, in many ways, being, you know, a gay man and having Lyme disease are two different experiences, but I do think it's important for, uh, for anyone who feels like they're in a, you know, smaller community out there to know that, frankly, Lyme disease, uh, well, for one thing, it doesn't discriminate ever. Um, anyone can get Lyme disease. And so I happen to be a LGBTQ person who has Lyme disease. And I think it's important um, for me to represent that group of people, if I can. Totally. I mean, I, 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 that's one thing that's been interesting to me. Like when we started doing these call, the meetups, we sort of had an idea of what the viewership and membership would look like. And it's just amazing the spectrum of people that come from all over the world, all over time zones, socioeconomic static, status, background, race, gender, identity, all of these things. Yeah, the, the bugs don't care, man. The bugs <laughs> just don't care. Um, so, all right, so we've got a couple more minutes here. I want to touch on a couple different things. Um, the one thing I, when we're dealing with talking about treatment with you that has been very helpful is uh, sweating and a sauna. And I just, I just want the people listening at home to know, you went to a, a sauna every day for how long? Yeah, I definitely went to a sauna just about every day certainly from like July, 2015 until COVID started in March, 2020. And you found that sweating really helped you with your recovery. Yeah. I mean, that was something I learned pretty early on, um, probably within months of just getting sick in, in the springtime of 2010. Um, again, a really interesting thing that I've learned from meetups, sweating and saunas don't work for everybody, but for me, sweating was probably the best thing that I could do to reduce my symptom set. And the result was always very clear. It was like, if I was dealing with a lot of brain fog, um, or, you know, muscle stiffness or something like that. And then I went for a run and sweated out and wore a couple layers of clothing, I would feel better within 30 minutes of finishing the run. Mm -hmm. So I, I realized pretty quickly that sweating was beneficial for me. And for, for many years, I ran every day um, on a treadmill or outside, not, not for speed, but just to sweat. Yeah. And then over time, that sort of shifted into going to the sauna uh, in addition, or sometimes instead. I mean, these days I run maybe maybe once once a week, but the sauna um, became a part of my routine because if I went to work and was stressed, and maybe that would like kick up some of my Lyme disease symptoms, the sauna would always bring me back to you know to zero, um, and so. You know, I relied on Equinox saunas or Philly Sports Club saunas um, for for years, and just couldn't do without them. Um, and everyone would joke at the office that, like, okay, Brooks leaving the office, he's going to go to the sauna, and then he's going to go home. And so it was it was something that people supported, and they knew that I needed, and was like a big part of my daily routine. So in the last like three or four years, you're taking these antibiotics, you're, you're going to a sauna, you're dealing with chemical sensitivities and all that kind of stuff. Where, where are you at now? How are you feeling now? Like, wh how would you describe your, your symptoms or your health situation in, in this moment? So it's interesting, you know, I've been telling people that I'm 95% better for like a couple of years now. <laughs> and I, um, and it's true, but it's hard to get from 95% to hundred. Yeah. And, and I've, I've learned that and been kind of humbled by that. So my life is normal, but I do have minor symptoms that crop up and I obviously can acknowledge them and sort of deal with them. But most symptoms are, are very much under control except for one, which is chemical sensitivities. And my, chemical sensitivities, which we talked about a little earlier, 
in the conversation, those did not get cleared up with antibiotics or the collection of like herbal supplements and tinctures that I currently take. Mm. And so it took me a long time to figure this out, but I've had to tackle chemical sensitivities in a totally different way, partially by using programs like DNRS and partially by what I would call like exposure therapy, which is on a sort of daily basis, wearing some article of clothing that I'm a little sensitive to. You're and making and, yourself suffer, basically. Yeah, I mean, it seems so counterintuitive, but, um, uh, but, but it's the only way that I think I can get my body to be less sensitive to some of the chemicals that I've become so sensitive to yeah. over the course of a long period of time. So as an example, um, and this will be kind of funny it, for, for the past year or so I've tried to become tolerant of, uh, like an organic baby laundry detergent that you can buy at whole foods. And that's what this shirt is, is, is washed in. And I'm a little bit sensitive to it, but a year ago I was very, very sensitive to it. Yeah. So over time, I think for the first year in the past eight, I think I've made tremendous progress. And I'm really proud of that because it's been such a difficult problem to tackle, but I've been looking for solutions. Mm. So um, I don't know, to be continued, but, um, and I obviously talk about this at, at meetups a lot, but I think I'm making a lot of progress and um, I'm very, very proud of that. Yeah, I mean, man, the stuff that these people have to deal with. In, in this community is just unbelievable. So uh, we're going to wrap up here in a couple minutes, but I, I do just want to, especially with you, I just want to ask like, how did, why did you want to start Generation Lime? Why was it important for you? For those of you that are listening, some, some of you probably don't even know what Generation Lime is. You might've just found us by Googling Lime, but we are on the board of Generation Lime. We tell people stories on Instagram and we host meetups so that people can find community and not be alone. Um, and so we started back in like 2017, 2018. And I'm just wondering what drew you specifically to wanting to do that? What, what was it about it that, that was something that you wanted to spend time on? Yeah, I mean, you, you and I have worked together for several years at this point. I think, that, I think that I knew I wanted to be involved in some sort of Lyme disease nonprofit as early as 2014. So that was six to 12 months after I was finally diagnosed with Lyme disease. Now, it took me a long time to find, you know, Project Lyme and to create with you and our friends what became Generation Lyme, but I at least had like my North Star many years ago, and I, I wanted to be somewhat involved in a, in a nonprofit. Um, when, when, when you and I and, you know, our other colleagues conceptualized Generation Lyme, that became like a hyper-focused sort of mission very quickly. And what was exciting about Generation Lime is for, for me, what I wanted it to be become was literally just two simple things. I wanted it to be an Instagram account where Lyme disease patients, if they were comfortable, could share their stories with the world and, um, and to do it in a way to create awareness and also to humanize this like very difficult condition that a lot of people have, but not a lot of people know about. And then the second thing was to create what I would call like your modern meetup for, for Lyme disease patients. There've always been meetups for Lyme disease patients, but we wanted to do it in a way that was, uh, you know, digital first, or at least it sort of evolved into that. Um, now, obviously we do our meetups on, on Zoom, but we used to do them in person. And I wanted our meetups to focus on support and being uplifting and for people to just feel like they could say anything in these meetups and we would listen and we would understand. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted us to be, even if we were gonna be a small organization, I just wanted us to be the best at those two things. And I think we've worked really hard at both of those two things. And I love what we've created. And now we're kind of, I mean, we're, we're somewhat big. I mean, when I think about it, 
um, because you know that I like to look at these numbers a lot. You and I, and you know Jennifer and Haley and and John and Zach and everyone else, we have through Generation Lime run 250 meetups since March 2020, and 3,000 people have attended. And what's really cool is you wouldn't even know that by just looking at our Instagram account. And that's the point. Our meetups are these safe spaces where if you have Lyme disease or are affected by it, you can just come and you can say whatever you want. And we're, everyone else is going to listen and provide support. And it can be a really special uplifting experience for anyone struggling with Lyme. Yeah, well, I was just going to ask you, what would you say to someone who wanted to, who was thinking about coming to a meetup, but I feel like you just did a great job answering that question. So I will, I will, I will shift it a little bit just to say, uh, just for a final question here, what is, what would you say to someone who is maybe at the beginning of their health journey, or they just got diagnosed and they are frantically searching for information on the internet, and that's how they found our podcast, and maybe they're freaking out or something, what would you say to somebody in that situation who's like new to this whole thing? Yeah, in fact, it's a great question. I was thinking about this over last weekend. Um, When I got Lyme disease, which was in 2010, Lyme disease had been discovered, you know, like 40 years before that. So people knew what Lyme was, but where I got information about Lyme disease came from a Lyme disease patient, Chad, and also from pretty random like health blogs on the internet and, and WebMD. Now there's so much more information. Mm -hmm. So Instagram is incredible. I mean, there are Lyme disease patients all over the world sharing their authentic stories of what it's like to have Lyme. And you can get a ton of information by just reading other people's very human, often very vulnerable stories. But as you probably know, like my best piece of advice is if you've recently been diagnosed with Lyme disease, you really should find someone to be your Lyme disease buddy. And what I mean by that is find someone who has had Lyme disease for a short or long period of time, because Lyme disease patients have the best information. They've tried all the treatments. They've seen all the LLMDs. They know where the best resources are. And Lyme disease patients for better or worse, often have much better information than most members of the medical community outside of LLMDs who are great because they have seen thousands of Lyme disease patients. And so they know everything about Lyme disease, but most doctors don't. So my best advice, if you just got a tick bite or you know you have Lyme disease, find another Lyme disease patient, or you can reach out to Generation Lyme and talk to Lyme disease patients to get a real authentic like sense or or set of advice as to what to do next love that all right well i think we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up there brooke i just want to thank you for being here and thank you for your time and also on behalf of those three thousand people that have come to meetups and all the people that we've connected to via our instagram i just want to thank you on behalf of all of them because Yeah, without you, none of this would have happened. And uh, yeah, you're a pretty awesome dude. So thank you for sharing your story with us. Of course. Thank you so much for leading the podcast. It's my pleasure. It's literally the least I could do. So uh, on behalf of Generation Lime, my name is Jesse Rubin. This has been Brooke Stoddard telling his story. Um, Please connect with us. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. You can check us out at genlime.org and get all the information on our meetups, on our podcasts, on ways that you can get involved. If you have any questions or if there's anything we can do, please let us know. And don't forget to rate and review us on wherever you listen to podcasts. We would super appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, please stay safe, please stay healthy, and we will be with you very shortly. So thank you so much. And uh, thanks, Brooke. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Jesse. (laughs) 